Hello, and welcome everyone to the Varsity Tutor Star Course Series, where I don't know what you had for lunch. Maybe it was a sandwich, maybe pizza, maybe Taco Bell, but I know it wasn't blood, or at least I very much hope it wasn't blood. But to many animals in the animal kingdom, that's exactly what they want, and we're going to learn about them today. Fortunately, we have the perfect teacher to teach you all about it, Coyote Peterson, who if you follow his Brave Wilderness channel, you know, has donated blood to many of those animals and to, to many others that um, just needed to get a taste, even if it wasn't their meal. And he's here to tell us about his experience with those animals and a little bit about how they came to be that way, why they drink blood and how to avoid getting your blood drank because he's been there and, and knows exactly how to do it. Now, one thing here is Coyote is not interested in, uh, in biting, stinging or anything like that. So please, let's keep it interactive. You can talk to him as much as you want here. Take a look at the chat panel to the right of the screen. He's going to ask you a bunch of questions to find out what you know and think about these animals. You can answer in the chat panel on the poll there. He also wants to take your questions. So whenever you've got a question, fire away in the last 10 minutes or so. I'll end interview Coyote with your questions to get you some answers. Feel free to put your names on them. It's always fun to know who's asking and, uh, and be ready for that. Last thing before I turn it over to Coyote for uh, what's going to be a, a blood boiling uh, extravaganza here. Make sure you got a camera nearby. If you've been to these classes before, you know that in about a half an hour, we'll give you a chance to lean into the screen, take a selfie with Coyote. If you upload that to Instagram, tag Coyote Peterson and Varsity Tutors, you'll be entered to win that very hat or one just like it um, from Coyote and a spot in our Wildlife Creature Club. They just did a little meet and greet before the show here, learned some amazing behind the scenes facts from Coyote. You could be part of that too. If you join the contest or enroll in Wildlife Creature Club. All right, with all that said, it's time to turn it over to your teacher for today, Coyote Peterson from Brave Wilderness. Thanks so much, Brian. I appreciate it. This is going to be a fun class. I'm very excited about tonight's lesson plan, Bloodthirsty Creatures of the Animal Kingdom. I always like to put quotes at the beginning of class, and tonight's quote is, the creatures are amongst us and they want to drink your blood. And trust me, I know this better than anybody, like Brian just said. And actually, a week ago, I was in Florida filming an episode all about mosquitoes, which, whether you knew this or not, they are the most deadly animal on our planet. And we did a crazy episode that we're going to give you a sneak peek of tonight. So this will be the first time in class that we've shared footage before it's even been edited by our post-production team. Like Brian said, uh, I'm Coyote Peterson, host of the Brave Wilderness channel. If you've not been in class before and you've never seen my content and you have no idea who the heck I am, you can search Brave Wilderness on YouTube. And I think at this point we have like 700 videos. So it's a rabbit hole of education, conservation, adventure, and a whole lot of entertainment. Uh, we just released a new series called Wild Field Trip that is specifically made for kids just like you, where I take a bunch of lucky kids out into the wild for the field trip of a lifetime. Uh, there's a new episode that comes out Saturday, uh, and they were super fun to make. So hopefully you guys check that out. Um, so let's get started with class, because today is all about the blood suckers. Now, the way we usually like to kick these things off is for me to ask you guys some questions, just to sort of get the gears grinding in your minds, get you woken up. I know we just got into class. For some of us, it's like seven o'clock at night. We've already been in school today. Are we going to learn more stuff? Yes, but this is going to be super fun. So here is our first question. Can you tell me which animal you think is the most interested in drinking human blood? You're probably saying to yourselves, oh, gross. Things drink human blood? Yeah, a lot of things drink human blood and other animals' blood for that matter. So let's uh, let's take a, take a guess here. You guys can write these answers in the comment section. I'll be able to see them. What do you think is most interested in drinking human blood? All right, let's see what we got. Sharks. Uh, well, sharks can sense blood. I'm not sure that they're so much interested in drinking blood. They eat things that have blood, but sharks is a good start. Uh, okay, I see bats, vampire bats. Vampire bats is a good one. Vampire bats will actually drink your blood. And we almost did a vampire bat episode a couple years ago. That's a long tangent of a story, but we didn't end up filming it, but they would have drank my blood. Okay, I see crocodiles. Uh, deer ticks. Somebody wrote deer ticks. So I see ticks too, wood ticks. Uh, yes, deer ticks are actually a really dangerous one because they can carry Lyme disease. So if you get bitten by a tick, you really want to try to get it off of you as soon as possible. Blood worms. Um, good guess. Now, blood worms technically are not going to drink human blood, even though they're named blood worm. They drink the blood of other small creatures that are in the environment. Okay, this is a good one. I saw it went by fast. I saw vampires and I saw somebody also wrote in Dracula. 
Yes, I guess if vampires were real, depending on what you believe, vampires and Dracula would probably drink blood, but I think we're probably okay. They're not going to drink our blood. Um, I see a couple of people have put spiders in there. Yes, spiders drink the bodily fluids of things. They don't so much drink human blood. Um, I guess they could, but most of the time we just get bitten by spiders, not so much the blood being drank being consumed. Uh, I just saw this one go by Chupacabra. I don't know if you guys know what the Chupacabra is, kind of a creature of the cryptozoology world, technically called goat suckers because they uh, drink the blood of goats, if you believe that the Chupacabra is real. That one might be a little bit far-fetched for most of science, but if you like cryptozoology, I guess it technically counts. Okay, so those are good answers. Lots of good ones pouring through there. Um, and like I said, if it was uh, Dracula that you picked, the good news is that Dracula doesn't really exist. So vampires are not going to be drinking our blood. Um, okay, I'm going to ask you guys one more question before we officially get into tonight's lesson plan. Which of these blood statements do you think are true? And I will read them off for you guys uh, because that's just always a little bit more fun when I get to read them too. Uh, blood signals a wounded prey item, which means it's probably an easier meal that makes sense. Is it predators like the color of red more than others? Is it letter C, prey species are often repelled by blood because it signals danger? Is it D, blood is a good substitute for water if an animal is thirsty? Or is it E, all of the above? So which of those do you think are true? I'll give you guys a couple of seconds to answer here. Mm-hmm. Just watching the chat line here. Okay, we got a lot of them. Okay, so here we go. Uh, it's not all of the above. So it is definitely not E, all of these are true. But the ones that are true are A and C. Blood signals a wounded prey item, which means quite possibly an easier meal. Now that would definitely be the case of a shark. Uh, bears can smell blood from miles away. The same thing with wolves and a lot of other mammal species. And letter C, Prey species are often repelled by blood because it sing signals danger. So that is technically a true statement. Um, we've experimented with that several times, including a recent episode that we did on sea lamprey, which is going to be one of our topics of tonight. So let's officially get into tonight's lesson. Hopefully you guys are all awake. Hopefully you all uh, had fun answering those questions. And the first thing we're going to talk about is which animals are considered bloodsuckers and what are some of their characteristics? I love these pictures that we have up here on screen because you see that one right there? It's a bird. You're like, what? There's a bird that drinks blood? Believe it or not, there is. Now the term for an organism that feeds on blood is hematography, which is a really strange word to pronounce, but hemo is sort of the term for blood and phagy is... I guess what combines it together to be like, I eat blood. There are a lot of things out there, believe it or not, that eat blood more than you would probably think. So animals that eat blood um, may mainly obtain the majority of their nutrition from ingesting the blood. And believe it or not, blood is actually pretty healthy for a lot of different organisms. And it's also an important part of their life cycle, especially for many insect species. Now, some examples of blood suckers include, and this is, this is very interesting. Most of you probably didn't know this. Most of the time it is the female insects or arachnids that rely on a blood meal to help produce their eggs. And ticks are a great example of that. Now only the females will drink blood and only the females are able to transmit disease. So that also works the same for mosquitoes. And we also noted here in my lesson plan that uh, mosquitoes, only the females drink blood and use it for egg production. Now, some of the other things that suck blood or consume blood that are both male and female include sea lamprey, vampire bats. And here's a cool vampire bat fact. Only three of the more than 1,300 species of bats in the world are vampire bats. So bats that suck blood, technically, that we would think, oh my gosh, if you get bitten by a bat, you're going to turn into a vampire. Of all the bat species that are out there, only three, of the vamp only three are vampire bat species and only three of them drink blood. How crazy is that? So it's a pretty small number. I see your odds of ever being bitten by a vampire bat are pretty much slim to none. Um, leeches are another great example. I'm sure a lot of you have seen our leech episode, Eaten Alive by Leeches, I think is what that one was called. Um, bloodworms, fleas, bed bugs, and even some birds like the vampire fish. 
Fin vampire finch, little cute tiny bird that eats blood. And I believe one of the ways that they consume the majority of their blood is finding insects that have already consumed a meal of blood. And then they eat the insect and in turn get that blood meal. Oh, totally gross, right? Now here are some characteristics of blood suckers. Whether you wanted to know or not, I'm gonna share them with you. In certain organisms, it is only a specific life stage or cycle that requires a blood meal. And it's such a strange term, a blood meal. I mean, can you guys imagine like, oh, you know what I'm gonna have for dinner? A blood milkshake, totally gross. But that is usually the preferred meal of some of the creatures that we just talked about. Not necessarily the milkshake bark, but you know, blood in some sort. They usually suck it up through some sort of uh, feature on their body like a proboscis that's kind of like a straw. Um, only one sex of the species usually ingests blood, blood in some cases, like I said, with ticks and mosquitoes. Um, a lot of blood suckers have a unique teeth structure or modified teeth to, to create incisions and access to obtaining that blood. So leeches are a great example of that, which we'll talk about later. Sea lamprey is another great example. And a lot of times, even things like mosquitoes have an anticoagulant and a numbing agent in their saliva so that they can move in on a prey item and inflict a bite with you not even necessarily knowing it. Sneaky little blood suckers that are out there. Um, many blood suckers have an anticoagulant, like I just mentioned, which are enzymes in their saliva that allow the blood to flow more freely. So if you've ever been bitten by a mosquito, you may realize after the fact that you've been bitten because of the wealth that forms, but if you ever actually see a mosquito on your body, you're like, I don't really feel anything. How is it filling up with blood so quickly? It has to do with that numbing agent and also the enzymes in the saliva, which allow it to drink up the blood much quicker so that they can quickly fly away before they are detected. Whew, that's a lot of information really quickly. So if you guys are all taking notes and want to know everything you can possibly know about blood suckers, I would say that is some of the most important points. Now, one thing you may be asking yourself is, Coyote, if all of these things are sucking blood, how dangerous are they to humans? Because you have probably been bit by a mosquito before, probably have been bitten by a, well, maybe not probably, but maybe you've been bitten by a tick before. So you're probably asking yourself, well, how dangerous is it to encounter one of these blood sucking creatures, whether that's leeches, mosquitoes, ticks, sea lamprey, not likely to be bitten by a sea lamprey, but just in case. So here's a couple of things that are important to know. Most do not pose a direct threat to humans or other animals because the amount of blood that they consume is usually very minimal. So if you think about how much of blood a mosquito drinks, your body has many, many pints of blood. So mosquitoes taking a very, very, very tiny amount. Even if you're bitten by a thousand mosquitoes at once, which somebody in this classroom right now has had happen, but we'll get to that in a minute you're gonna be completely fine. Now, the danger with some blood sucking organisms is the transmission of infectious diseases, bacteria and, virus through, and viruses through the process of ingesting blood. And the greatest examples of those are mosquitoes and ticks. Both of these creatures, mosquitoes being insects, ticks being arachnids, can transmit a number of different diseases. Now you have other creatures like leeches, which technically won't transmit many different diseases, but if you, remove a leech in the wrong way, you can actually squeeze some of the contents of its body. So it kind of throws up or regurgitates into the wound and that can cause an infection. Um, great example of why you always wanna know how to properly remove a blood sucker if you find one on you. Now I could go on a long tangent about how to properly do that with ticks, but you might see that episode coming out later this year from Brave Wilderness. We've actually tried to produce it in the past, and believe it or not, it is a lot harder for me to get eaten alive by ticks than you guys would think. We've tried to film this episode now three times and it failed in every instance. So maybe this year it will actually happen. Okay, now we're about to get into the meat of the class, but before we do, I've got one more question for all of you out there watching. Look at all these awesome pictures. Ooh, I love that sea lamprey one. Okay, question number three. Which animal is the most dangerous blood drinker? And if you were just listening to everything that I was telling you, uh, then you're probably going to be able to pick this out pretty easily. Is it the vampire bat? Is it a wood tick? Is it a mosquito? Is it a sea lamprey? Or is it a leech? I'll give you guys a couple of seconds to answer this. So if you remember back everything that I just said about which 
organisms are the most dangerous for blood sucking. I did mention one type. Well, I guess I didn't mention the deer tick specifically, but deer ticks are the ones that transmit Lyme disease. So maybe that's a little bit of a hint. Okay. So we got a lot of answers coming in here. See a lot of you putting mosquito and wood tick. Now, technically, if I were to just say ticks and mosquitoes, that would be the right answer. Uh, I didn't talk enough about deer ticks and wood ticks and the difference between ticks. So if you picked B wood tick, I'm still going to give you the point for being accurate in selecting ticks. Wood ticks are not as dangerous as some of the other tick species. And the most dangerous in this list would technically be the mosquito. Over a million people die every single year from mosquito borne illnesses. Isn't that crazy? So if you combine all of the other predators on the face of the planet, sharks, bears, mountain lions, wolves, all those combined together, very few which actually ever attack or kill humans. Mosquitoes kill more people than every other predator combined. How wild is that? Okay, so now we are going to get into the blood sucking creature lineup. And this, of course, if you've joined us in class before, is the point where we show you some cool video clips from Brave Wilderness videos, and which of course can then encourage you to go back and watch the whole episode if you haven't seen it before. And I give you a little behind the scenes insight as to how we film the episode, why we film the episode, and uh, some things you may not have learned in the episode. So first up, Brian, let's cue the leeches. <sighs> I don't know why. I was convinced to doing this experiment. Now, leeches are something that I've run into rather frequently. Of course, if you've seen a lot of Brave Wilderness episodes, you guys know I spend time in swamps looking for snapping turtles, alligators, all sorts of creepy creatures and large reptiles, I guess, in some sense. And I've occasionally gotten leeches adhered to me, but most leech species, believe it or not, do not drink warm blooded animals blood. So mammals, right? If you're a mammal and you walk into a swamp and you get a leech on you, that leech might be hitching a ride, but there are very few species of freshwater leeches in the United States that will actually drink human blood. And to perform this episode, we actually ordered two different species of leeches from a lab. One that was a common freshwater leech and one that was a European leech used for medicinal purposes. Now there are many points um, in the world of medicine where they would take leeches and put them on big catastrophic wounds that are on a person's body because the leeches will actually help to suck away some of the um, excess blood and can actually help with the healing in some process. In this instance, it was more just me showing you the experimentation of what happens when these leeches adhere to your body. And I had my hand in the water for only a matter of minutes before the leeches latched on and they have this really cool mouth part like we were talking about earlier where it's almost shaped like a triangle and they slice into your body. And when they do that, or I should say before they do that, they release their saliva onto your skin and it has a numbing agent. So during this process, this grotesque process that you're watching there. Um, I actually couldn't feel them biting me. I could feel the scraping, but I couldn't feel the bite actually happening. And what I didn't realize was going to happen is the amount of anticoagulant that they were going to put into those wounds on my hand. And I bled for almost 36 straight hours after filming this episode. So if you're squeamish and you don't like being around blood or watching things with blood, I probably say that is not the episode for you. And if you like blood and you really like to be squeamish, you watch the aftermath from that video and it is like a zombie apocalypse movie. So just a little warning to all of you younger audience members out there. If you're afraid of blood, that is not the episode for you. But leeches, for the most part, are not something you need to be afraid of. And if you go back and watch those episodes, that episode, you will learn the right way to remove a leech if you end up having one on your body, because the removal process for leeches is actually the most important part. It's them hanging on that's not necessarily dangerous for you. It's if you take them off the wrong way. Because remember, like I said earlier, if they regurgitate any of their meal back into your body, no bueno. It might end up causing an infection. Okay, so moving on, this next one is the piranha. I've had my fair share of run-ins with piranhas uh, in the wild specifically. And you can see if you've seen the piranha episode, you know that I was accidentally bitten by a piranha while filming for our Animal Planet series, Brave the Wild, in Brazil. And the funny story behind that is that we caught several piranha. And at one point when I was holding one and presenting it to the camera, I tried to show everybody its teeth. And in the process, it kind of 
lunged its jaw forward and bit off the tip of my finger. So the moral of that story is don't get your finger too close to a piranha. But the episode that we filmed in a controlled setting that you're seeing the footage of here actually proved that piranha are not necessarily interested in eating human flesh and then in turn, I guess, drinking their blood. Most people think from the old piranha horror movies that have been out in like the late 80s and early 90s, the piranha are just going to devour a human corpse if you jump into the water with piranha. That is in no way true whatsoever. I've swam in water, uh, crystal clear water with piranha and didn't receive a single bite. But this um, experiment, we felt really helped put piranha in a more positive light because while they are fast, kind of creepy looking and have very sharp teeth, they definitely don't have any interest in eating human flesh. Believe it or not, for the most part, piranha consume animals that are already dead. So in most instances, they are considered scavengers. Now they will eat other small fish species and it depends on which species of piranha specifically that you're talking about because there's some that actually even eat fruit and nuts. So piranha have a bad reputation, but in the end, I was able to prove that they're not something you need to be afraid of. And then again, your odds of ever being in the water with piranha, unless you're swimming somewhere in the middle of South America, are very unlikely that you're even going to run into them. But that was a super fun episode to film. And if you haven't seen it, it's called Eaten Alive, Human Hands versus Piranha. And I won't give away everything about that episode, but it has some pretty cool things that you likely didn't know about those fish. Now, our next bloodsucker is the sea lamprey. And I'm sure a lot of you have seen the sea lamprey episode if you watch Brave Wilderness. Um, we've done several sea lamprey episodes at this point, from me sticking my hands into a container filled with them to me intentionally induce, inducing a suction on my arm, my neck, and my stomach. And recently, we dropped me into a dunk tank filled with a thousand of them. I don't, I don't know why I do what these things are, but they're entertaining and you guys get to learn a lot about a species like this. Now, the sea lamprey specifically is an invasive species all throughout the Great Lakes. And what we ultimately learned from these episodes is that they are not interested in drinking human blood. They primarily feast upon fish. So what they'll do is adhere to the side of a fish and then those weird teeth. Remember earlier when we were talking about some of these creatures have a unique mouth and tooth design? These guys suction cup on and then use their tongues, which kind of look like a cheese grater, to scrape away at the scales and the flesh of a fish. And then they drink their blood and bodily fluids. I mean, you want to talk about a horror film scenario that is tops in my book. But what we learned is that they're not interested in drinking human blood. The big problem with these parasites, because that's technically what they are, um, parasitic fish, I should, should say, is that they greatly impact the native fish populations that live in our Great Lakes. So I worked with the Great Lakes Fishery Commission to specifically focus on the conservation work that they're doing to remove sea lamprey from the environment so that that native fish species population is sustainable. Now, if you go back and watch those episodes, you'll find that there's all sorts of craziness that happens. And uh, again, if you are squeamish when it comes to blood, let's just say when I did induce some of those suctions because of the nature of the power in that suction, and then of course those razor sharp teeth, there's definitely some blood. So be warned if you're younger and squeamish around grotesque things. Now, next up, this is the big one. This is the big one that I wanted to share with you guys tonight because I literally just got finished filming this a week ago. And Brian, before we play the video, because this one's gonna actually have audio um, to it, we have been trying to film a mosquito episode for several years to show you guys exactly how a mosquito bite works and then, of course, how to treat those bites. And most of you are probably thinking, Coyote, I know exactly how to treat a mosquito bite. You take your fingernail and you, you poke a bunch of like star shapes into it, which I must admit I have done in the past and it kind of works because it helps distribute um, the, the liquid that your skin produces as a histamine um, when, against the saliva and anticoagulant from the mosquito bite. But this episode specifically, we tested out a product called Chigger X, which you will see in that episode when it comes out in a couple of months. And I got to tell you, it works wonders because I received several hundred bites in the process. But Brian, let's play this video and let everybody out there in class get a sneak peek behind the scenes of what it's like to have a day on location filming for Brave Wilderness. What's going on, Varsity Tutors? A special behind the scenes look at Eaten Alive by the World's Most Deadly Animal. 
the mosquito. We just finished filming the scene. My hand is probably covered in welts. This is the yellow fever mosquito, one of the most dangerous of the several thousand mosquito species that exist on our planet. My arm has been inside the box for about 15 minutes, and the purpose of this episode is to show you what happens when a mosquito bites you. What is that process actually made up of? Because most people think, oh, I'm stung by a mosquito, but it's actually a bite. And the science behind how a female mosquito bites you is really pretty interesting. So we still got my arm inside of the box, and on the back side here, most of the females who have had their blood meal are resting and digesting, while the males are still swarming about. The next step for us is to get my arm out of here and ultimately treat all of these itchy welts. But it's not often that we get to show behind the scenes video sneak peeks before an episode's even done, but everybody out there in class today watching will get to see this episode in either April or May. It will be called Eaten Alive by the World's Most Deadly Animal. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this sneak peek of Coyote Peterson turning himself into a blood buffet line in the name of science. All right, guys, back to you, Brian. I guess it's back to me. So there's a little sneak peek of the upcoming episode. And actually, I just finished writing that script today. Um, we got to work with a group called the uh, Florida Keys Mosquito Control District. Um, and this is one of the first episodes where we've been able to utilize a lot of really cool toys in the making of the episode. And when I say toys, I mean helicopters, boats, we went to a remote island that is completely uninhabited by humans. And then, of course, for the entertainment and science side of things, we got me bitten by like a thousand mosquitoes. So um, hopefully you guys will enjoy that episode when it comes out this spring. Um, but this summer, you'll probably run into mosquitoes. And while they may be the world's deadliest animal, your odds of contracting a disease from mosquitoes in the United States is very, very rare. So hopefully you guys aren't too afraid of those creatures, but we show you definitely how to watch out for them. Okay, so that brings us to the next part of tonight's class. Another question, because everybody loves to challenge their minds to try to answer my ridiculous question. So I'll read this one along with you guys. What is the best way to avoid blood sucking creatures? Is it A, wear natural or organic insect repellents? Hmm, interesting. Uh, is it B, do not swim in bodies of water with high plant concentration? Is it C, dress comfortably when hiking by wearing tank tops, shorts, and flip-flops? Is it D, shower less so that you're stinky and creatures will avoid eating you? Ugh, gross. Is it E, do not travel to other planets where alien blood-sucking creatures might be present? Who wrote these questions? Or is it F, always wear long sleeve shirts, pants, and protective neck or face coverings when hiking during peak pest season? Peak pest season. Say that 10 times fast. Okay, I'll give you guys a couple of seconds to answer. Okay, so a lot of answers coming in. I think you guys are on to my tricky questions. Give you guys a couple more seconds. Hey, I, I really like the one that was do not travel to other planets where there are blood sucking aliens. I thought, you know, I see some people have picked that, but obviously that one's wrong. Okay, so the right answers are A, B, E, and F. Those are technically all correct answers. If you dress accordingly and use insect repellent wisely, then you should be able to avoid the majority of alien-like blood-sucking creatures when you're out there on your next adventure. And while I know sometimes it's fun to dress comfortably. Trust me, I've been out there in the wild with people who have worn flip-flops on scouting expeditions. And I don't know why you'd wear flip-flops out in an area where you're going to get eaten alive by mosquitoes. Not a good idea, guys. Okay, so how do you avoid blood, getting your blood sucked by a blood-sucking creature? right? Staying safe out there is always something that we try to encourage with the Brave Wilderness videos, and it all depends on the species. Now, the most common human bloodsuckers are mosquitoes, ticks, and leeches, right? We've also learned that two of those are the ones that are most likely to spread any diseases. These suckers are attracted to a combination of things that include the carbon dioxide we exhale, body heat and vibrations. Those three things, believe it or not. So if you're out there running in the wild 
and you're breathing really heavily like that, that is actually going to draw these creatures to you. Mosquitoes and ticks specifically use chemical signals that come off of an animal's body, any mammal specifically, to recognize the fact that a easy meal may be present. So all of those elements are things to keep in mind. And while I know it's pretty impossible, you can't go out there and not breathe. You can't go out in the summer on an adventure and not sweat. But if you dab yourself off with a towel or you keep on long sleeve shirts that are lightweight and long, uh, long pants that are also lightweight, even when it's hot out, that's definitely going to help you avoid these animals. And of course, when it comes to ticks, they can crawl all over your body and under your clothes. So it's always wise after any hike, whether you're in a field, or a forest, or if you're walking through water, to check your body very thoroughly after your expedition to make sure that no hitchhikers have latched onto you to get a free meal. Now, when it comes to first aid after a blood sucking incident, most blood in most blood sucking incidents do not require any immediate or drastic first aid, right? So if you find a tick on yourself and it's only latched on, if it's not completely swollen with blood, you don't have to have a huge panic attack. If you discover a common blood sucker on you, try to remove it as quickly as possible. When it comes to ticks, the quicker a tick is removed, a quicker a tick is discovered and removed, less likely your chances of getting an infectious transmitted, transmittable disease. Most of the time when you see a tick, they're really small, but if you look up ticks online or if we can successfully film a tick episode at some point, you'll realize that the females start out really small, but when they fill themselves with blood, when they're on an animal for enough time, they actually swell up and look like a grape. It's crazy how their bodies can expand. And it's during that process that you have the chance of really transmitting a disease. Same thing kind of goes for mosquitoes. Now, granted, mosquitoes bite you a lot faster, but like I said, the odds of catching a mosquito-borne illness in the United States is very slim. Um, now, mosquito bite can be itchy, and that is because it's your body's natural reaction forming a histamine against the saliva and anticoagulant. So with those couple of small tips, I think you guys are going to be completely safe this summer when you're out on the adventure. Now, I know that a lot of these things can seem really scary, but again, remember these animals are not necessarily going to cause you harm. And if you pay attention to your environment, you dress appropriately and you investigate your body. Once you've been out there on an adventure, you'll probably get all these things off you safely, even if you do encounter them. Um, okay, well, uh, a couple of sneak peeks for you guys. Like I said, we've got the mosquito episode coming up really soon. We do have a tick episode in the works. And as a little insider information, the reason this has failed so many times in the past is because it's believe it or not, a lot harder to get a tick to bite you than you would think. The experimentation that we've tried in the past is we have caught ticks. So I'll go through a fielded situation, like a field, like a out in the wild prairie type scenario, get the ticks on my clothes. And then we've actually placed them multiple places on my body and covered them up with little bottle caps that have holes in the top so they can breathe. Not a single tick has bitten me yet at this point. So we're really hoping that we'll just get a tick adhered to somebody naturally this year and then film an impromptu episode on how to properly remove it. Um, like I said, uh, we've also got some other big adventures in the works, including an upcoming trip to South Africa where we're going to be filming rhinos, black mambas, spitting cobras, that one's going to be interesting and a chameleon scavenger hunt. So uh, some big conservation moments, some crazy stuff and some cute chameleons. You can't go wrong with that. So in conclusion, the buzz of mosquitoes around your ear or the sight of a tiny tick crawling up your leg can be a bit unsettling, but it's important to remember that bloodthirsty creatures are a natural occurrence in many ecosystems. The majority of encounters with these animals cause more annoyance than they do harm. However, it is important to be aware that certain species may transmit infectious diseases in your area. So act accordingly and try your best to prevent any bites. Um, very cool. So that pretty much brings us to the funnest part of class, which is always the question and answer session. But um, big thanks uh, to Varsity Tutors. We've got a lot of other cool things in the works. And for other interactive opportunities, uh, make sure to check out Varsity Tutors Wildlife Creature Club, because there's some really cool things that come with that, including challenges challenges in the learning lab. And if you sign up for Creature Club, you get the chance to join class ahead of time and be behind the scenes with me to ask all sorts of cool questions and get behind the scenes information. There should be a link up on your screen right now where you can click to sign up for Creature Club. And with that, Brian, I will turn it over to you.
Awesome. Hey, thank you so much, Coyote. It's uh, like I was telling you before class, my heart is still pounding from the Piranha episode, especially even, <laughs> even knowing you weren't going to get bit. It's just, uh, it's uh, it's crazy video there. Uh, for everybody out there, get your questions in. You guys have had some amazing questions. I'm glad we have time to eat some answers. But first up, make sure you get those cameras out right now, because if you've got a love of animals in your blood, um, now is the time to, uh, to lean into the screen and get a picture with the world's favorite animal lover, Coyote, here. And if you up Upload that to uh, Instagram, tag Coyote and Varsity Tutors. You'll be entered to win a spot in Wildlife Creature Club. Of course, you can always join if you don't win. Um, but uh, that plus a hat just like Coyote's as well from Coyote's collection. So uh, hopefully you guys have those cameras nearby. We're going to go full screen to Coyote right here, get you guys those pictures. And once you've got the shot you want, keep firing those questions over and we're going to get some answers. So I'm going to do two different pictures, guys. The first one will be a normal smiling face, and then we will do an alien abduction face. Um, we thought it would be a little difficult to do a blood sucking one. So a lot of these blood suckers are kind of alien like, so we'll do an alien abduction one instead. All right, ready? Here comes the uh, smiling face. I'll hold this for like 30 seconds. Ready? Here we go. I don't know if that was quite 30 seconds, but hopefully you guys got it in that amount of time. All right, let's do the alien abduction face. Ready? All right, I'm going to have to kind of reposition myself for this one. Ready? Okay, hopefully you guys got that one too. Oh, that's a weird... Weird angle to try to fit it all into the screen. Okay, uh, hopefully I think you guys that got the qualifies as yoga, Coyote. I think what you're doing, you held it long enough. I think uh, yeah. you that was your workout for today. Yeah, that's my uh, that's my yoga lesson for the day for sure. So, awesome. Hopefully you guys got those pictures. If you didn't get the perfect one, I'm going back full screen to Coyote every time he answers a question. So you'll have plenty more opportunities. And again, throw those up on Instagram. We'll have the official handles up on a slide on the way out. And you'll know exactly what to do to, uh, to win your prize package and spot and wildlife creature club. All right. We had some amazing questions here. Uh, one of my favorites, Amelia actually out there, uh, Amelia, give yourself a pat on the back. You had some great questions. One of those being, we know sea lamprey are invasive species in the great lakes. Where do they come from originally? And then I'll ask a follow-up with that so we can keep you full screen for a while. Is there a, a place where more blood-sucking creatures live than is there sort of, you know, one climate or place they all tend to live? Uh, but that first one is, uh, is where did sea, where are sea lampreys native to? Great question. So if you go back and watch the original sea lamprey episodes, you'll learn that they actually invaded from the Atlantic Ocean. So sea lamprey, given the name, um, actually spent a lot of their life in the ocean, but they have migrated inwards through different man-made canals. So it's a great example of humans altering an environment that then opens the door literally for an invasive species to come in. Now, the fact that they've made it into the Great Lakes um, is a big part of their life cycle because they can survive in both salt and fresh water. So um, they will migrate upstreams to lay their eggs and perform part of their life cycle and then go back out to deeper water. But originally, sea lamprey uh, came from the Atlantic Ocean. Thank you. I knew you would have an answer for that. That's uh, that's pretty amazing, and it is fascinating to see how some of these things are our own doing. If we're annoyed by sea lamprey, we only have our, ourselves to blame. Um, okay, another one that a lot of people had actually. You mentioned uh, kind of early on that it, in many species, including mosquito, it's only the female that drinks blood. Um, in those cases, what does the male eat? If, uh, if a lot of the nutrients are going to the female through blood, you know, male mosquitoes, what are they doing? Great question. So male mosquitoes specifically focus on eating pollens and nectars, believe it or not. So they're kind of vegetarians in a certain sense. Um, they don't live a very long time. Um, once they go through their metamorphosis and hatch out and get their wings and are flying around, they will make that annoying buzzing sound that we're so accustomed to hearing. But their purpose is pretty much just to pollinate and to breed with females so that another swarm of mosquitoes can be born. So they're, they're, they do have uh, proboscis. The proboscis is sort of like a needle type thing that comes off the front of the head, uh, but their proboscis is designed slightly differently than the females when it comes to all the internal pieces parts. And we get into that in detail uh, with the mosquito episode that will be coming out. 
Awesome. Thank you. And thanks to all who were, uh, who were asking that question. I was kind of fascinated by that one myself. Um, you also, you kind of opened the door a little bit, sort of like we did with canals, um, with uh, talking about the chupacabra. Uh, we had quite a few people asking about uh, either just imaginary animals or, you know, organisms other than animals that, uh, that may drink blood. Chris asked, um, do you think if the dragon were real, it might drink blood? And some other people asked, are there any plants or other types of life that survive on blood that aren't quite animals? Hmm, interesting. Well, when it comes to dragons, given my knowledge of Game of Thrones and other dragon based things like Lord of the Rings and everything I read growing up, I would assume that dragons are scorching their victims with fire and then eating the whole thing. So technically there would be blood inside of what it is they're eating, but I don't know that there's any dragon that would necessarily just drink blood. Although I guess in the world of imagination, if you want to create a dragon that drinks blood, anything is possible. And when it comes, what was the other part of that question, Brian? That was a uh, plant someone asked specifically plants. about and other people were just asking other types of life that, that drink blood that aren't necessarily animals. Yeah. So, you know, pitcher plants, Venus flytraps, and a number of other insect consuming plant species, you know, all things have their own certain type of blood, I guess, in a, in a sense, I, I'm not super well versed in like, what do you technically call the blood or bodily fluids of some, some insects necessarily, but I guess, yes, there are plants that are considered carnivorous and the carnivorous meals they usually take are insects, arachnids, and sometimes small amphibians. So in that sense, yeah, there are some plants that absorb their nutrients through um, living organisms. That's a great question everyone is asking. I'm always amazed by just the, the cool array of questions that, uh, that come to everyone's mind. So keep keep them coming. we got a few time for at least a few more. Um, so keep your questions coming. Uh, another one, a lot of people asked, I think Jadia was one of the, the people who, uh, who asked it first as we got into kind of your greatest hits of, uh, of getting bit or almost getting bit. Um, do you know about how many animals have bitten you and uh, which one hurts and bled the most? Mm, good question. Yeah, I, I get this asked quite frequently. So it's like, is it either how many bites in total have I taken or how many different species? Because they're, they're technically two different answers. And I, I will try to answer them both. When it comes to quantity of bites that I've taken all time, it is definitely well into the thousands, I would say. But you have to remember, like hundreds of them came from a couple of different fire ant incidents um, or harvester ants or other smaller things, right? So um, I consider my fire ant bite and sting scenarios to be the greatest quantity, but I really only count them as like one thing. Now, when it comes to animal species, I have been bitten by. So remember, bites and stings are also very different. And with the fire ant specifically, you get a bite and a sting. It's the sting that is actually injecting venom into you, but they have to bite to hold on to move their abdomen and inflict that sting. So back to the, the total number of species I've been bitten by, I don't have an exact number, but it is probably upwards 100 I would guess at this point, and we're counting a lot of things that like you've never even seen, right? I've been bitten by an opossum, which has the most teeth out of any mammal in North America, but that was nothing that was ever caught on camera. It was something that happened um, during a presentation for a wildlife center. And I was working with one of their uh, opossum that was in rehabilitation. And this thing like super cute, super calm, super friendly. I think it got a little scared with the amount of audience that was there. And it just at one point turned and chomp, chomp, chomp into my arm. Like just like nothing happened. And I was just like, uh, okay. And I just went on with the presentation, but I had like six puncture wounds in my arm because they have really long teeth. Um, so that's one that nobody ever saw. I've been bitten by dozens of different lizard and snake species, non-venomous snakes, of course. Um, but the real big ones, most of them you have seen on camera for the most part that we did um, intentionally. But in my line of work, bites are unfortunately always going to happen. 
I love that it's over a hundred, but you've lost count. I mean, I know I don't know about the rest of you out there. I know exactly my list is uh, is mosquito, hamster, human, and it's three. I know it's exactly three. Whereas for you, it's well over a hundred, and uh, and just like it's at a certain point, you just can't count anymore. Which leads to another one of my favorite questions. Uh, Liam and his sister Lily, you met in the pre-show. They're Wildlife Creature Club members. Um, they wanted to know: um, Are you ever scared before filming of these episodes? And uh, at which point were you the most scared? Um, you know, I wouldn't say I'm necessarily scared to film any of like the intentional bite or sting stuff that we do because we do a lot of research in advance before we create uh, the opportunity to find the animals and then film the scenario. So with that in mind, there are certainly things that make me nervous. You know, I mean, the giant desert centipede was very nerve wracking. Whenever you are going to put yourself in a position that you're going to feel pain, obviously your adrenaline gets rushing and you don't want to do it, but then you go through with it. And uh, I look back and say, okay, well, the education and entertainment that comes out of it is, is always a value. But um, there hasn't ever really been any scenario that I'm like, man, I'm really afraid to do what this is. But remember, uh, I've got a lot of practice at this. You guys should never go out and try to ever be intentionally bitten or stung by anything because you never know how your body is going to react to that scenario. And whether it's an infection or something venomous, the most dangerous aspects of stings specifically and bites if they're venomous is how your body reacts to those venoms. And if you have an allergic reaction, um, things can get very dangerous very, very quickly. For example, when I did the bee beard episode, um, I was stung over 60 or 70 times on my face, my arms, my neck, and I swelled up really, really bad, but we were um, very nervous that I was going to have a really bad allergic reaction would maybe have to use an EpiPen. But fortunately that uh, was not the case and I was fine. But a single bee sting can send somebody into anaphylactic shock if they're allergic. So that's certainly just something you need to be aware of. Yeah, and thank you for bringing that up too. I know it's really fun to, uh, to watch Coyote get bitten, stung by things, to talk to him about it. Um, but also we know, you know, we see him on video but the people behind the camera, there's first aid kits. There are people with, uh, you know, the phone on standby if they need emergency support. Um, he does all the preparation. I've met a lot of the folks at Brave Wilderness. They're awesome people, but he's not going out there doing that by himself. They've done the research and all those kind of things. So legitimately, we don't try this at home because, um, you know, you need an entire Brave Wilderness team. All right, last one for you, Coyote. I always like to end on a high note. This will not be that, I don't think, but this is such a fascinating question. Whoever asked this, thank you so much. Um, what animal, we know all about the animals you find fascinating. Which animal do you find the least fascinating and why? Ooh, least fascinating. Wow, that's a, I really got to think about that one. That's tough because I can usually always find something fascinating about an animal. But let me try to think of an episode that we've done that I was like, eh, okay. Wow, that's, that's really tough because I, I love all of them. And the, the thing is, whenever we capture a moment on camera. One of the most exciting things is getting that footage into post-production and writing the story behind it to make it uh, entertaining and educational for the audience. But some of the ones that I think are maybe less exciting are ones that we've repeated in the past, right? So I love snapping turtles more than any animal on the planet. I'm always trying to catch the next biggest snapping turtle, but you can only tell a snapping turtle story so many ways. So Despite the snapping turtle being my favorite animal, I will say the snapping turtle is probably the least interesting for me to film at this point because I've caught so many of them and because we filmed them in so many different occasions. And what's funny is that some of our editors are like, Coyote, we're not going to film any snapping turtle episodes this year, are we? I'm like, no, probably not until we have some crazy snapping turtle scenario that presents itself that I feel we've got to get on camera. So um, I love snapping turtles, but I think we've probably filmed enough snapping turtles at this point. That's all the way you guys said. All the animals are fascinating, but the next one is more fascinating because you haven't done the story on it. Thanks to everyone out there who was typing in my brother, my uncle, and although yes, people are animal, they went specific with it. But I like uh, Coyote's diplomatic answer the best. All right, that takes us to the end. Hey, thanks so much, everyone out there, for all of your questions and participation. We are thrilled to see your pictures up on Instagram. I will have the official handles. It's at Coyote Peterson at Varsity Tutors. We'll have those up on a slide here, so you can enter to win that hat and a spot in Wildlife Creature Club. Before I do that, let me turn it back full screen to you for a last shot at uh, pictures for everybody. And Coyote, any parting thoughts for everybody? 
No, Brian, thank you so much uh, again for having me. Big shout out to Varsity Tutors for all their support. Thank you guys so much for joining class tonight. Lots of exciting stuff to come for myself and the Varsity Tutors team. Make sure to check out the creature classes. Lots of good stuff to be had there. And uh, we will see you guys in the next class. Remember, be brave, stay wild. We'll see you on the next adventure. Bye, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight.